First of all, I'd like to welcome you good people on behalf of our sponsor. We are one of the few remaining radio shows that's lucky enough to have a sponsor. So if you enjoy yourself during the next half hour, you could do us all a big favor if you would. And that is sometime this week, stop by your neighborhood RCA Vicks dealer, pick up a 27-inch television set or a record player or something. Because we'd like to be working up here next year at the same time. I don't know whether you know it or not, but through, oh, uh, throughout the country, with the exception of Los Angeles, we have a new time this year. We're heard on Friday evening, <coughs> excuse me, and also you know that Phil is out on his own for the first time. So what do you say we all get together and give a great big welcome to the man who discovered the South, Phil Hacks, the Jersey. it means to me to have me come out here all by myself, and you're all smiling and applauding and glad to see me, and I just want to tell you I love you for it because I need it. <laughs> I've been with Jack Benny for 16 years, and there ain't no money connected with that guy. <laughs> Jack does on Saturday night is taking a dark room, gives you one fast tour to love and bloom, and you've had it, Clyde. <laughs> Anything you can do to help me earn an honest living, I'll certainly appreciate it. <laughs> I got off to a bad start. When I married Alice, they told me she had money, but I'll be damned if I can find it. I looked everywhere. He said, maybe your brother's got it. I went with him too much. But... It's really tragic, you know? Hey, it's awful nice to see you guys, you service guys in the audience, and I just want you to know that you can come to my show anytime because, ladies and gentlemen, the servicemen are the finest audiences we have. And it's... Partial to the Navy because I was in the Navy during the last war myself. That's right, partial. I fought the Battle of Catalina. <laughs> You're laughing. We lost eight lobster traps over there. Well, the officers didn't eat. They blamed us. You know, the water came up and took them away. But they had a very uh, unique way of selecting their enlisted men when I went into the Navy according to what they'd done in private life. See, they were particular in those days. So I went in with a couple of buddies of mine, and one of them was a street cleaner, and they put him on a minesweeper. Oh. Yeah. And this other buddy of mine was a construction guy. He tore down stuff and carried it off, see? So they put him on a destroyer. <laughs> How I ever wound up on a ferry boat, I'll... <laughs> You're going to be a good group tonight. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, do you hear the story about the guy who walked to the barbershop, said, how many ahead of me? The barber says three. The guy went out, he don't come back. Next day, he comes in against Mr. Barber. How many ahead of me? The barber says three. The guy walks out, he don't come back. Now, the barber's going nuts. You know, he's up all day on his feet in the clink of them scissors and all. You know, the guy's... Good. Oh, that's the Chinese grip system. See? So, uh, so the guy, he don't know. So the barber, you know, he finally gets all worked up every time the guy goes out. So he walks down to boot black. The barber does. He says to boot black, he says, look, every day a guy comes in, what's going on in his head? I tell him he goes out, he don't come back. He says, if he does it tomorrow, follow him. I want to know. <laughs> Next day, the guy came in, says to the barber, how many ahead of me? The barber says, three. The guy walks out. The boot black follows him, comes back in about 20 minutes. The barber says, where'd he go? Where'd he go? The boot black says, to your house. <laughs> to fill out the 12-story building. This guy's blind drunk. You know, he's away from home on a loose. And he falls out of this building. He's 12 stories high and he's drunk and he falls out and boom, he hits the sidewalk and there's a big crowd around. He gets up, brushed himself off. Fellow walks up says, what happened? He says, damn fine. Oh, I just got here. <laughs> Drunks walking down a railroad track, both of them blind. They're walking down a railroad track, and one drunk looks at the other and says, Man, that's the longest staircase I ever came down. <laughs> the other one says, I don't mind that, it's these low banisters. In the <laughs> they were on wine. You know, uh. Um... <laughs> Uh, whatever little success, ladies and gentlemen, we've attained, I'd like to tell you is to you nice people listening to our program and also for our organization. We have, ladies and gentlemen, one of the finest working organizations I think that is possible to obtain. And I'm very thankful because in our business, 
one or two people can't do it. You must have a very fine functioning organization. And we're very close. Well, for instance, everyone you see sitting on that stand does an outstanding job on his or her. Take it for We have a genius on our hands, and I am uh, I'm speaking the truth now. He has already had two of his own compositions played in the Hollywood Bowl. He has been nominated six times for motion pictures for the Academy Award. He was nominated last year for the beautiful conducting and uh, arranging of all the wonderful music that you heard in the Hansbridge Sanity story, and just missed the Academy Award by a few votes. This year, he's just finished another big picture, and we're all keeping our fingers crossed. He just did a picture called the French line, and he is now doing the new, uh, in the uh, process of making the new Martin and Lewis picture, so this kid's going like a bear. This is Walter Sharp and the Garden. That's all hand work, no sergeant. <laughs> happy about the guys in the band. Most of these fellows have been around me for many, many years, ladies and gentlemen, because I started as an alleged musician. I was a drummer. They led us in the union. That's about all you can say for it. But I did have an opportunity of meeting a lot of wonderful guys and a lot of wonderful people, and uh, we've held our friendship over these many years. Every fellow sitting up there has done something outstanding in our music business, and as much as most of them have been with the uh, well, I'd say all of the big Dixieland bands and uh, all of the important bands in the United States. They now have families, and they're out here and at other businesses, and they come with me today. But I have a couple of them I could introduce you and tell you the history of every boy that would be interesting, but we don't have the time, but there's a couple of them I'd like for you to meet. One of them you hear every night. Tonight he'll be on on KNBH and does a wonderful job and is one of our outstanding orchestra leaders in the whole United States. Albino Ray, ladies and gentlemen. Another fellow we used to room together years ago. I'm not going to tell you how many, but uh, he too has been very, very successful. He is known as a tradition in his particular line of business and his particular type of music. His records, some records that he made 15, maybe 18 years ago, uh, are collectors' items. He's still making records. And he will go down in history as one of the greatest exponents of Dixieland jazz, Red Nickel. The Red Nickel. <laughs> this is Bill Foreman, our announcer. I'll introduce him like he's just the best of the country. Now we get into, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have you meet somebody. Without her, this program wouldn't be possible. I'm not going into a eulogy. I'm just going to tell you I've been married to her for 12 years, and we have two beautiful children, and she's not. Only the most beautiful gal in the world, but didn't get that a lot of talent. Now it's back! on our program, they two are two of the most competent little actresses we have in this business. One of us at the present time over making a picture with Bing Crosby in White Christmas, and we're all pulling for her. Say hello to uh, Janine Roos and Ann Whitfield, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> dog never bites. <laughs> uh, now we have some guests. We have three guests, and I want you to be awfully nice to them because they're very important guys, and I am very thankful that they came over to work on my program. Because they, too, are well known in pictures, all of them, and they do a lot of important things in our field of, uh, of acting. The first one has been with us before. It's awfully nice to have him back again, and uh, I want you to be awfully nice to him. Say hello to Dick Allen, ladies and gentlemen. Our program 
him, not this year, but several times last year. We hope to have him back again a lot because we're always assured of a fine performance, Mr. Dick Ryan. Here's a fellow that's been a friend of mine for many, many years. We used to shoot stuff together up out of Bakersfield, and we used to have a lot of fun. And it's awfully nice to be able to renew old acquaintances. He has one of our outstanding actors, ladies and gentlemen, in Hollywood for quite a number of years, Mr. Douglas Dumbra. <laughs> fellow that steals our show every week, and we're happy because he's got a lot of talent. He plays the part of Julius Abruzio, the grocery boy, Walter Ketley. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to see us. Mainly thanks for being so nice, and I certainly hope you enjoy the program. And what I'm trying to say is, for God's sake, laugh. <laughs> but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? Tis the east, and Juliet is the sun. Oh, Harris, you ought to be pitching for the Yankees. You've got so much on the ball. <laughs> RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, and first in television, presents the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Enjoyment here is the Phil Harris Alice Bay Show, transcribed, written by Ed James and Lou Derman, with Elliot Lewis, Walter Tetley, John Hubbard, Janine Roos, and Whitfield, Walter Sharpness Music, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. Tonight we bring you a bright little gem entitled The Traffic Problem in Los Angeles or Dante's Inferno. <laughs> the stars of the RCA Victor program, Alice Bay and Bill Harris. When the average husband refers to his better half, he means his wife, but not Bill Harris. To fill his better half is his left profile. <laughs> or is it his right? Well, anyway, here he comes with both profiles shining and a full set of teeth to match. <laughs> Two loves have I, it's a perfect parlay. My wife's a doll, but I love RCA. <laughs> la, la, la. Oh, hiya, honey. What are you looking at? Oh, Phil, the, pi the prints of our new pictures just arrived. Oh, they did, huh? Well, let's mail them out. Let's not keep all that beauty to ourselves. Hey, they look pretty good, don't they? I see them. Gosh, you look wonderful, Alice. Just wonderful. Oh, thank you, kind sir, she said. Well, I don't know about me. Somehow, pictures don't do me justice. <laughs> Phil. No, honey, I mean it. Now, look at this one. Look. He's got that boyish twinkle in my eyes, but... Well, he didn't capture my lovable, devil-may-care smile. You mean your wolfish leer? <laughs> no, I mean the magnetic charm that makes me irresistible to all females between 16 and 60. Is that their age or their IQ? <laughs> Now, take it easy, will you, Brenda? <laughs> you married me, didn't you? Don't that show that I attract the brainy type? Duh. <laughs> What'd you say, Bob? <laughs> hey, huh? hey, do that again, Alice, will you? <laughs> That reminds me of a dame I used to go with in Nashville. Oh, you're kidding. No, no, honey. 
No, I'm not. You should have seen her. Red hair, blue eyes, and skin like a ten-year-old. How old was she? Ten years old. <laughs> of course, I was only 11 at the time. In them days, I was known as Marshmallow Harris. Toast to the campfire girls. <laughs> Them was the days. <laughs> Say, Phil. Yeah. Speaking of girls, which you somehow always manage, what do you suppose happened to ours? They should have been home from school an hour ago. Maybe they got too smart and the teacher's keeping them in to give them some more stupid pills. <laughs> it happens, it happens. Phyllis told me she said she would have had straight A's last month if it wasn't for them stupid pills. Oh, I don't know. Those girls tell you anything and you believe it. Honey, honey, wait a minute. Phyllis got a D in English, didn't she? And you know no daughter of mine ain't getting no D in English if they ain't giving her no stupid pills. <laughs> Phil. Phil, what's a coquette? A what? A coquette. It's a small Coke. Why? <laughs> Just testing. Alice, I happen to know this English language like a native. So go ahead. Test me again. Ask me anything. All right. Uh, what's a silhouette? It's a small salute. <laughs> Thought I didn't know, huh? And a baguette? A baguette? Well, that'd be... That'd be, uh... Oh, oh, a baguette's a small girl. <laughs> you know, honey, they didn't hand out none of them stupid pills when I went to school. Well, they handed out something. Hi, everybody. We're home. Well, it's about time you kids got here. Where you been? Oh, girls, you know I worry every time you don't come straight home from school. But we did, Mom. You just can't get across Ventura Boulevard, that's all. Well, why don't you cross with the light? There isn't any light at White Oaks. And every time you try to cross, the cars begin chasing you. But we fool them. We keep running back and forth. Had a girl. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Don't give them a chance to aim. Just get them. <laughs> oh. Don't they have a crosswalk at White Oak? Well, it's all rubbed out. Well, how about the safety zone? Honey, them things are pickup stations for the Blue Cross. <laughs> About the only way to get on the other side of Ventura Boulevard is to be born there. <laughs> well, what happened to that petition that Willie got up for a light at White Oak? Didn't everybody sign it? Well, the city said the funds were all gone. Oh, fine, fine, funds. A big city like this, and they can't shell out for one puny light. I know somebody can fix it. Sniffy. Sniffy? <laughs> she thinks he's so wonderful. He's a district attorney, isn't he? Some district attorney. All right, wait a minute. Sniffy is the district attorney? How could a 15-year-old kid be well, a... Well, look, honey, it's boys' week, and Sniffy's father appointed him honorary district attorney. Oh, well. If he's anything like his father, he'll be a big help. My boyfriend is the assistant fire chief. Some boyfriend. And he can get a light faster than any old district attorney, I bet you. He can not. He All can right, too. kids. What good's an old district attorney? Phyllis. He isn't old, and he's Look, better Alice. than any old fire chief. He isn't Alice. either. He Look, certainly will is. will you cut it, kids? He is, too. He Alice, is. Will you it cut is. It? It, it is. Will you it stop is. that? It stop it. Pardon me, is this the contented hour? <laughs> oh, hello, Elliot. Come on in. Hi, Uncle Elliot. Hi. What's up? I could hear you clear down the driveway. Uncle Elliot, isn't a district attorney better than a fire chief? Assistant fire chief. All right, girls, all That's right. That's even worse. It isn't either. Okay, that does it. Upstairs, the both of you. But, Dad... You heard your father. Upstairs. But, Mom... Not another word. Gee whiz. You and your district attorney think he's so wonderful. He's better than your old fire chief. He isn't either. He is, too. He isn't. He is, too. 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 thing I had the bottle glued on that table. <laughs> what are they doing? Trying out for what's my line? <laughs> Elliot, uh, Alice and I have something we'd like to discuss. Go ahead. I won't say anything. I'll just listen. 
Well, wait yeah. a minute, honey, wait a minute. Elliot. Hmm? You know, uh, sometimes a married couple <laughs> likes to be alone. They do? <laughs> How would you like it if you were married to Alice and I was around all the time? Let's try it that way for a while. All right. <laughs> <laughs> have a problem. There's no traffic light at White Oak, and Alice and Phyllis have a terrible time getting across the street. Why do they have to cross the street? To get on the other side. <laughs> oh, Curly, Joe Miller would be proud of you. It ain't a joke. He thought it was. Elliot, the school's on the other side. Now, nah, that's ridiculous. Who ever heard of a chicken going to school? <laughs> what chicken? The one that crossed the street to get to the other side. <laughs> Alice, can I see you out in the garage? What's going on out in the garage? Elliot, now look, honey, this is, this is a very serious problem. Oh, okay, let's all go out in the garage. It's got nothing to do with the garage. <laughs> Alice and Phyllis can't cross the street because there isn't any traffic light. Why don't they use the crosswalk? Because there isn't any crosswalk. Okay, let's paint one. Now look, Elliot, <laughs> listen to me, don't... Still. Wait a minute. You don't have to say a word to me, honey. I promised you, and I'm not getting mixed up in any more of his crazy ideas. But you don't it's have a to... good idea. I like Rocket it. Rocket ship to the moon, uranium and... You what? I think Elliot's idea is very good. Oh, honey, you better get some sleep. Lie down right over here. Now, take it easy. Just rest oh, a minute. No, stop it, Phil. There's nothing wrong with me, and there's nothing wrong with Elliot's idea. But every other time Elliot's had an idea, you... You've gotten into trouble, I know. But how can you possibly get into trouble painting a few white lines? She's right, Curly. I don't know. It doesn't I... take any brains. A three-year-old child can paint a white line. You see, Curly, it's right down our alley. <laughs> <laughs> All we need is some paint and a couple of brushes. I got a feeling that something's going to happen. But let's go paint some lines. <laughs> Boy, look at them cars. There must be a million of them. Look at them later, will you? We've got to get these lines painted. Okay, Mr. Rembrandt. Where we start? Right at the corner. Now, you start on this side, and I'll go across the street, and we'll both work toward the middle. Got it? Got it. And Curly? Look out! <laughs> that guy almost killed me. Did you see him snarl when he missed? Yeah. <laughs> Look, Elliot, huh? I'll start over here and you go across the street. Okay. And Curly? Look out! Curly, why don't we just paint lines on this side? <laughs> Elliot, why do you ask so many stupid questions? <clears throat> That's stupid? Sure it's stupid. We're supposed to paint a crosswalk all the way across. If we only put lines on one side of the street, it's no good. We'll have all this paint left over. <laughs> well, we could paint a couple of lines down the middle A straight one for men drivers And a zigzag one for lady drivers <laughs> We're going to paint a crosswalk Okay, let's start painting All right, now, move over there about ten feet And then we'll paint across together Right, you just give me the notice All right On your mark Get set Go <laughs> Elliot. Yes, Curly? Let's talk this thing over. Okay. <laughs> if we can't get out into the road, we can't paint the lines, can we? That seems like a reasonable supposition. And every time we step off the curb, we get chased by a car. Right? Dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> now, there's only one sensible way to do this. One of us has to paint, and one of us has to act as a decoy. <laughs> A decoy? Yeah. What's a decoy? A decoy. Well, well, it's like, look, one of us stands in the middle of the road and the cars all aim at him. <laughs> so they don't notice the other guy who is quietly painting. You mean the guy that's out there ducking cars? That's a decoy. Yeah. One of us. 
You wouldn't have any ideas about which one of us. <laughs> Good luck, Elliot. <laughs> so long, Curly. Just remember, I'm doing this for your wife and kids. Your wife and kids. Ah, you missed me. Ah, you missed me. Missed again. <laughs> Get my painting done, Curly. Well, if it ain't crazy legs, hearse. <laughs> Back in that old fake root, isn't yeah, that? Yeah, man, you were spinning in and out. <laughs> How's the painting coming along? Are you kidding? I didn't even get the brush wet. <laughs> Fine. I'm getting chased all over the boulevard, and you go to sleep on the job. Are you kidding? You weren't gone two seconds. In two seconds, how could I get ten years older? Oh, <laughs> now look, let's try it again, and try to stay out there a little longer. Oh, wait a minute. Huh? Wait, 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 Curly. Just hold it. Now what's the matter? I got a better idea. People get killed even in crosswalks, don't they? Sure, but it ain't considered cricket. <laughs> cricket schmicket, they get knocked for a loop. You know what we do? What? We dig a tunnel. Elliot. No. That's a very practical idea. I don't know Look, about Curly. The... Do they have crosswalks over the Hudson River? No. Do but... they have tunnels under the Hudson River? Well, sure. Then but... why ain't it a good idea? I ain't said it wasn't. I ain't said it wasn't. I just don't think that Alice is gonna like it, that's all. She liked the crosswalk, didn't she? And this is better, believe me. Well, I don't know. But... Elliot, where are you going? You stay right there, Curly. I gotta borrow a pick and shovel. <laughs> How you doing, Elliot? Hey, I'm not kidding, Curly. This is tough work. I'm getting a blister. Ah, oh, what are you worried about? Another couple of hundred feet and you'll be all through. Go ahead, Roy. Keep digging. Let me hear it up here. Dig it out. All right. Hey, Curly? Yeah? There's another flock of wires down here. <laughs> <laughs> what kind? Same as last time. Bell telephone. <laughs> Pull them out. All of them? Sure. What do we want with telephone wires? Now, if they was electric wires leading to an RCA Victor television set with a 27-inch screen, that'd be different. You mean RCA Victor television sets work good in tunnels? Good. They even work in a cave. Peter the Hermit's got one in every room. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> But these are telephone wires, so I chop them out, right? Right. Okay. Chop, chop. Ha, <laughs> ha. boy, Elliot. You're doing fine. Well, and how are you this fine evening? Oh, oh, oh. Hello, officer. Beautiful night, isn't it? You and your friend lost something? Oh, no, no. We're just taking a hole. Hey, Curly. Here's the wire. Okay, toss it out. Yep. Atta boy. Just some old telephone wires we chopped out, officer. I see. Hey, Curly, I gotta rest for a minute. I. Oh, hello, officer. Would you mind telling me exactly what you're doing? Well, when we started, we were painting the crosswalk. Eight feet under the ground? No, no, no. No, you see, my friend here explained to me that they didn't have any crosswalks over the Hudson River, but they had lots of tunnels. So we decided to dig one. Oh, this is going to be a tunnel under the Hudson River, is that it? <laughs> oh, officer, they have tunnels like this all over the world. Like in Germany, under the Autobahn. And you're digging a spare. <laughs> He's got a great sense of humor, Andy. <laughs> no, no, officer, look. <laughs> Get sharp as a biscuit. No, look, uh, you, uh, you don't understand, officer. You see, I've got two little girls, and they have to cross the road. Like Joe Miller's chicken. But there's no light here. So we're digging a tunnel instead. You're digging a tunnel under Ventura Boulevard? You know a better way to get across? We could build a bridge, but a tunnel's so much more practical. Especially when it rains. Yeah. Well, you keep digging your tunnel, boys. I've got to make me call into the station. Yeah, all right. So long, officer. It was nice talking to you. Yeah, you come back any time. Hey, he was a nice guy, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's got a lot. Hello, Tim. This is Mike. Send the wagon. I've got a couple of jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll only stay a few minutes. All right, Mrs. Harris. You'll find your husband in cell two. Uh, that's uh, the bridal suite. 
Thank you. The bridal suite? Yes, ma'am. That has twin straitjackets. <laughs> oh, Phil. You were supposed to paint two little lines. Honey, honey, it's all a mistake. We'll be out of here in no time. Wait till I tell my congressman. Just wait. What am I going to tell the girls? Their father's a jailbird. Now, don't worry, Alice. I'll be out the first thing in the morning. If they hadn't have taken away the pick and shovel, we could have been out of here tonight. <laughs> brought your pajamas and your toothbrush. Oh, thanks, honey, but it's not that bad. This ain't a bad jail. It's nice and warm. Well, I'd better go, Phil. Can't you stay a few more minutes? But the girls... No sense going out in the cold when you could stay here in a nice, comfortable jail. Phil, I ought to go home. Honey, please. I simply can't stay. Baby, it's cold outside. I've got to go away. Baby, it's cold outside. This evening has been, been hoping that you drop so in. very warm. I'll hold your hands there just like My mine. mother will start to worry. Beautiful, what's your And hurry. father will be pacing the floor. Listen to the fireplace So roll. really, I'd better scurry. Beautiful, please don't Well, hurry. maybe just a half a drink more. Put some records on while I The pull. neighbors may think. Baby, it's bad out there. Say, what's in no this drink? No caps to be had out there. I wish I knew Your how. eyes are like stars. To right break now. the spell I'll take your hat, your hair I swell. ought to say no, 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 Mind sir. if I'm moving At closer. least I'm going to say that I tried What's the sense of hurting my pride? I really can't stay. Oh, baby, don't hold out Oh, but it's cold, cold outside I simply must baby, go the answer is but no. Baby, it's cold outside. The welcome has How been lucky that you dropped so in. nice and warm. Look out the window at my that storm. My sister will be suspicious. Your lips look delicious. My brother will be there at the door. Waves upon the drop of my show. My maiden aunt's mind is vicious. Gosh, your lips are delicious. Well, maybe just a cigarette more. Never such a blizzard before. I've got to get but home. But, baby, you'll freeze out there. Say, lend me a call. It's cold. up to your name knees out there. Oh, you've really been grand. I thrill when but you touch you me. Hey, how can you do this thing There's to me? There's bound to be talk tomorrow. Think of my lifelong sorrow. At least sorrow. there will be plenty implied. If you get pneumonia I and really die, can't stay. get over it, baby. Oh, but it's, it's cold. cold. I'll The court will rise. <laughs> hey, Curly. I'm getting worried. Oh, worried about what? We didn't do nothing. What's wrong with digging a tunnel? Quiet over there. Yes, Your, Ma uh, Your Honor. Yes, sir. This will court of the Law Sanitary Judicial District, Division 32. The Honorable Robert Anderson presiding is now in session. Be seated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, this is Boys Week, and uh, so assisting me on the bench will be a representative elected to this office by the student body of the Encino High School. My colleague and associate, the Honorable Julius Abruzzio. <laughs> Proceed, Judge Abruzio. It's a pleasure, Your Honor. Bailiff? Yes, Your Honor? What's the first ducket on the docket? <laughs> People versus Phil Harris and Elliot Lewis. Charged destroying public property. I find them guilty and sentence them to life imprisonment. Wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Julius, it's us. Your friends. Step down. <laughs> Judge Abruzio, uh, may I confer with you for one moment? Okay, Your Honor. Everybody hold it a second. My honor's going to confer with his honor. <laughs> yes, your honor? Uh, uh, Judge Abruzio, before we sentence the defendants, don't you think it might be a good idea to hold the trial? But, Judge, I know these guys. We'd be letting them off right if we executed the bottom. <laughs> I object on the grounds that he's irrelevant, immaterial, and inconstitutional. <laughs> According to the 21st Amendment. The 21st Amendment? 
That repeals prohibition. <laughs> yeah, wasn't that a beauty? <laughs> By all means. Oh, Julius, you wouldn't do a thing like that, would you? <laughs> now look, you little fink. Twenty bucks for contempt of court. What? And twenty bucks for asking questions. Forty dollars, please. Pay the man, Curly. You and your tunnels. Here. <laughs> Judge Abruzio, shall we proceed? Do we have to? Well, Julius, the, the courts of this country are designed to protect the innocent as well as to punish the wrongdoer. In our democracy, every man is deemed innocent until proven guilty. Well, let's prove him guilty and get it over with. <laughs> Who's the first witness? The arresting officer, Your Honor. Hiya, Mike! Hello, Junior. Oh, we're in great shape. <laughs> I object. And 20 bucks for objecting. $20, please. Thank you. Oh, don't mention it. Don't mention it. Swear in the witness. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Proceed, Your Honor. Mike, what were these criminals doing when you found them? Digging a hole. I object. It was a tunnel. Now you did it. It opens by itself. <laughs> Get you outside, you little creep. Elliot, will you stop it? Stop. That'll be fifty dollars more. We must have moved to a higher court. <laughs> Seventy dollars, please. What are we doing? Buying the courthouse? <laughs> now what did I say? A hundred bucks for trying to bribe an officer. Proceed, Judge Abruzio. Mike, would you say that these murderers was under the influence? We didn't say nothing. <laughs> we didn't even move. Spoil sports. <laughs> Judge Abruzio, are you implying that these men have been known to indulge? Indulge? They indulge till they bulge. <laughs> Mr. Harris. Yes, Your Highness. According to the complaint, you and this other gentleman... Gentlemen, now I object. Twenty dollars, please. That wasn't me. I didn't say nothing. That was Julius. Oh, stop quibbling, for goodness sake. <laughs> Mr. Harris? Yes, sir? I recognize the spirit which prompted your action. Recognize it? You can bottle it. <laughs> but we cannot have the people taking matters into their own hands. After all, what would we have if everyone decided to dig his own tunnel? Live pedestrians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid the court can do nothing but find you both guilty as charged. But, Your Honor... Judge I... Abruzio will pass sentence. Have the trash get ready. <laughs> Mr. Harris? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Lewis? You just wait, you little crumb. I sentenced you to 160 years of hard labor. Julius, Your Honor, all we did was dig a hole. Uh, Judge Abruzio, the penalty in a case of this type is generally a fine. You mean I can't have them executed? <laughs> not even one of them? <laughs> I'm afraid not. Gee whiz. According to my calculations, we need another $210. $210? Do- For what? I find them $210. Now, wait a minute. That's 500 bucks for digging one little hole? Uh, not exactly. It's 500 bucks to install one traffic light at Ventura and White Oaks. This is Phil again. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls, we've tried to have a little fun with the traffic problem, and we hope we gave you a few laughs. But we'd also like to remind you that the holiday season is coming up, and that means a lot of added traffic on foot and in cars. 
So let's all try to take it a little easy, especially around the schools. When we're driving, let's watch those traffic lights and crosswalks because they'll be there, so look for them. Let's all be careful and have a real happy holiday this year. Good night, everyone. Say good night to the people, honey. Good night, everybody. That's my girl. Included in this program transcribed were Douglas Dumbrill, Dick Elliott, and Dick Ryan. The part of Julius was played by Walter Tetley. This has been an NBC Radio Network presentation.